Welcome, everybody, and good morning, and uh, this is the Church at Pleasant Grove's regular uh, Sunday service, and we're glad that you have joined us. Um, we don't know how you found us or how you're here. Maybe you're a regular church attendee. Maybe you're not, but we are super glad you're here. I'm Andrew, and this is John. Hey, guys. It's so great to have you today. Uh, I know we're kind of getting used to, uh, even though this still feels kind of abnormal, I, I feel like we've settled into being used to meeting in whatever ways we can. And uh, it's just great to share the time with you and to see all the community groups and see all the people posting uh, about what we do when we get together together on Sundays in this unique way. So we're just really glad that you're here. And like uh, Andrew said, if you're new today, man, welcome. However you came about uh, this, this time together, just know that uh, this is God's people gathering in the ways uh, that God's people can. And what a blessing that we could do it with you today as well. So welcome. Yeah, so this little intro. It's sort of just kind of our way of saying, hey, this is what we're going to be doing today. This is what our day looks like. And uh, we do our normal things every time we gather. We will uh, we'll participate in giving. We'll talk about giving and serving the Lord in that capacity. And there's multiple ways you can do that. And if you're a part of our church, you know that and you can do it online. Or I would say you could do it in the back at church on Sunday, but that's uh, not uh, acceptable anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would we would accept it, but it's not acceptable anymore. You're gonna you're gonna have a hard time getting in the door because it's locked. But we also uh, some of the other sacred acts for us are that we are going to sing together today, and so uh, in a few moments, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have some friends join us. Andrew, why don't you tell them about worship today and what we're gonna be having again? Yeah, and so we've decided to to kind of in our worship time, you know, not not necessarily feel like it has to be us, but our friends down in Dallas uh, that we ha we watch every week at the porch, uh, they do worship and we do it live together. Uh, we watch together as they do it. And they do these just amazing sets of worship songs that are strung together and they're so encouraging and they're super produced. Or they look excellent. The music is great. The mix is well. And so as we kind of been going through having to figure out how to do this new way of service right now we just feel that having real good quality music not that our worship team's not quality they are 
but we can't get together. We can't put everybody in the sanctuary. We can't put everybody in the same room to do this. There's just too many problems with that. And so this is a great way for you to experience an actual worship set that lets you be drawn into worship with your family and your home. And, you know, you can stand, you can man, be, stand if you want, you know, sing loud. I want to, I want to hear you, you know, I really won't, but I think that would just be part of what we're inviting you to do. It's not just say, Oh, we're going to sit back and watch this. It's you participating and letting yourself be in the moment of worship. So, cause it's a, it's a sacred act. We do not only together, but we do it as individuals. So that's who we're, that's what we're doing. And that's what you're going to see as we do our worship. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and like you said, don't be afraid to uh, do something that maybe is different than what you did last week or what you're used to. Uh, all across our church, we are meeting and uh, being and making disciples in different ways right now. Uh, our, our youth are meeting on, on Wednesday nights and having a devotion. They'll have a Zoom call today at 1 p.m. Uh, for our middle schoolers and high schoolers. Our elementary, as you know, uh, there'll be a time for them directly after today's service. Our preschoolers and toddlers our community groups across the board, people are doing things in unique ways because the gospel is still very true and that we have so much to rejoice in and be excited about. So uh, like you said, jump in there and, and do uh, the things that you would normally do and maybe even grow during this season. It, it may feel weird, uh, but I believe uh, that, that we're going to experience things in a fresh new way because right now when all the other things of familiarity are stripped away, then we are left with what's most important. So we're excited about that time of worship today with you. Yeah, we we also really want to, I guess the word would be just, we're really just super excited about stepping back into our Common Thread series. Um, we have, since the beginning of the year, you know, it's kind of funny, I was telling somebody today, we started this series just to do it for four weeks uh, to kind of to, to walk through just like four big chunks of scripture to kind of see the common thread of Christ and the redemptive plan of, of God for us. But man, we did the first week and we decided, man, Genesis was great. Let's do Exodus. And so now we have moved all the way through the book of Joshua and it's just fantastic. And so in the process of doing that, well, today we're actually going to kind of break the sequential order of scripture or not of scripture, but of the books. And we're going to jump into to get ready. I know this may seem like not the right time, but it's absolutely the right time. We're going to jump into Job today. Not Job, but Job. Um, so, uh, John, tell us, kind of take us, give us the intro to what that looks like today. Why why we would jump there and, and, and where we're going to go. Well, I think, number one, like Andrew said, it, you know, when we began this series, and it's based upon these Bible Project videos, which are just amazing videos theologically and take you through uh, sort of the, the true themes, not just of all of scripture, but each book individually and how it ties into that. Uh, we can see, you know, God really preparing us for this exact moment because we are doing everything by video right now and, and by live streaming. And so uh, these are, are, are perfect ways. And we, you know, after Easter decided, let's, let's continue in that. It's the right way to do it. And in particular, we're moving to Job uh, because Job doesn't really happen in the chronological order of scripture. Job is, is outside of the historical books. And it's into the wisdom and the poetry books. And so Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Song of Solomon, these are books that are in the Hebrew uh, poetry and wisdom section uh, of the Bible. And so they happen chronologically at the same time. So we're about to, in a few weeks, we'll, we'll get to Samuel. We talk about David, but as you know, David wrote a lot of those Psalms. And so uh, even though Psalms is a book located, you know, a, a lot further down in the actual way that we have uh, arrange those books. And so Job really is timeless uh, because, and we'll see that in the video today, it, this book is not set in a particular time really on purpose. So historians believe it probably happened somewhere uh, between the Tower of Babel and way before Abraham. And so this is before the law, this is before animal sacrifices, and it's really a, a really profound discussion uh, on the topics of suffering and really the justice, whether or not God rules the universe by justice that we understand or that we share. And so there's a lot of questions asked in it that, that we feel like a lot of people are asking right now in their lives anyway. And it's just, it's just God's perfect timing that we're moving into this uh, at, at a moment where I think we're all, um, you know, maybe asking a few more questions than usual in our life. This idea of asking questions of where we are in our life comes from the, if, we just acknowledge it, this massive world crisis 
this massive change of lifestyle of routine that we're all in. And one of the things that's super important, vital to those of us who are followers of Christ, who are declaring who he is, is that we don't do that alone. We don't ask those questions alone. We don't want, we've been saying it for a long time. And this is one of those moments where we want to lean heavy into that. And if for some reason you're watching us today or you're sharing this time with us today, or you're a regular person that comes to the church at Pleasant Grove and you haven't had the chance over the last, really the, the last 40 days to be engaged with another individual in conversations about all of these pieces and about what God's doing in your life or where you're struggling or the questions you might have. And we strongly encourage you to reach out to us, reach out to another one. It's, it's kind of like a wellness check. Let's make sure we're doing that. So super important as John was saying earlier. And I, I just, for me, that's a really big thing right now. I know that I get the chance to do it multiple times throughout the week, whether it's uh, through an elder uh Zoom call or a staff Zoom call or a Zoom call. I had one this week with uh, some some uh, people at the Chamber of Commerce. We have a Bible study we do weekly. Just making sure that I'm talking openly about what God's doing in my life in this season. And so that takes us, leads us into this Job space. So, you know, today before we uh, step into to, to worship, I we just want to take a moment and read some scripture and and just invite you into the space and make sure that you know that you know, this is just not you being entertained today. This is you actively worshiping the Lord through singing, through worship, through taking in the word of God into your life, through praying together. So, uh, John, why don't you share some scripture with us? Yeah. Hey, and this is a scripture that just means so much to me for whatever reason. This is one, uh, even before all the quarantine of those things that, uh, when I speak this, it just brings courage to my life and reminds me, and I want to remind you, uh, that, uh, you're not alone, uh, that you belong. Uh, and that you are uh, not beyond God's repair or God's reach or God's concern uh, that he is with you. And David says this in Psalms 127, one, I just going to read the one verse, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Yep. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so uh, this morning, as we sing, we just pray that your heart's reminded of that, or maybe your heart's informed about that for the very first time, and that through the course of today, uh, you will find that there is a God that we're going to share with you, uh, or we're going to remind you about, who is uh, stronger, who is full of more grace than you thought. And as I keep discovering as a recovering Pharisee in my life, uh, that at every turn, He's better and bigger, and His grace is bigger than I thought it was. And so we encourage you with that this morning. And now we're going to uh, get to sing together. So make sure you sing out and we love you. And we'll be back in a few moments uh, to continue with the next part of our service. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love. The sun says free, oh, it's free and I'm a child of God, yes, I am. He last, he has ransomed me, his grace runs me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. 
shadow, you won't lie to mountain, you won't climb coming after me. There's no wall, you won't get down, lie, you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow, you won't lie to mountain, you won't climb on coming after me. There's no The Lord with me Oh, come exalt His name Together glorify The Lord with me Come exalt I saw the Lord, and He answered me, and delivered me from every fear. May it be, Lord, those who look on Him are radiant, never be Never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my hand to the Lord, the Son of
The book of Job, it's a profound and very unique book in the Bible for lots of reasons. The story is set in a very obscure land that's far away from Israel, Uz. The main character, Job, he's not even an Israelite. And the author, who's anonymous, doesn't even set the story in any clear period of ancient history. This all seems intentional, though. It's like the author doesn't want us to be distracted by historical questions, but rather to focus simply on the story of Job and on the questions raised by his experience of suffering. The book of Job has a very clear literary design. It opens and closes with a short narrative prologue and then an epilogue. And then the central body of the book is dense Hebrew poetry, representing conversations between Job and four dialogue partners called the Friends. These conversations are then concluded by a series of poetic speeches given by God to Job. Let's dive in and we'll just see how it works together. The prologue introduces us to Job and we're told that he's the blameless, upright man who honors God. He's a super good guy. And then all of a sudden, we're transported into the heavenly realms, and God is holding court with his staff team. It's a very common image in the Old Testament describing how God runs the world. And among the heavenly beings is a figure called the Satan, which in Hebrew means the accuser or the prosecutor. And it's like we're watching a court scene. God presents Job as a truly righteous man. And then the accuser challenges God's policy of rewarding righteous people like Job. He says, the only reason Job obeys you is because because you bless him with prosperity. Let Job suffer, then we'll see how righteous he actually is. And then God agrees to let the accuser inflict suffering on Job. Now, it's at this point in the story that most of us go, what? Why did God do that? And then we assume that this book is going to answer that question, why God allows good people to suffer. But as you read on, the book doesn't answer that question. Nothing in the book ever answers that question. The prologue is setting up the real questions this book is trying to get at. Questions about God's justice and whether God operates the universe according to the strict principle of justice. And the response to those questions comes as you read through to the end of the book, not at the beginning. The ultimate reason for Job's suffering is simply never revealed. So the prologue concludes with a suffering and bewildered Job who's rebuked by his wife and he's approached by three friends who are going to try and provide wisdom and counsel. Their names are Eliphaz, the Tamanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite. They're all non-Israelites like Job. And they represent the best of ancient Near Eastern thinking about God and suffering and the human condition. And this moves us into the main part of the book. First, Job speaks. And this is how this section of the book works. First, Job is going to speak, and then they'll follow a response from a friend. Then Job will respond to that friend. Then another friend will respond to Job's response, and so on, back and forth, for three cycles. And this whole debate is focused on three questions. Is God truly just in character? And does God run the universe on the strict principle of justice? And if so, then how is Job's suffering to be explained? As we're going to see, Job and the friends, they're working from a huge assumption about what God's justice ought to look like in the world. Namely, that every single thing that happens in the universe should operate according to the strict principle of justice. So if you're a wise, good person and you honor God, good things will happen to you. God will reward you. But if you're evil and stupid and do sinful things, bad things will happen to you. God will punish you. Now, Job's constant argument throughout his speeches is this. First of all, that he's innocent. And so the implication of that is that his suffering is not a divine punishment. Now, we know from the prologue, both of these things are true. Remember, God himself said, Job is righteous and blameless. And so Job concludes his argument by accusing God. God either doesn't run the world according to justice, or even worse, God himself is simply unjust. The friends, on the other hand, they beg to differ. Their argument is that God is just, the implication being that God always runs the world according to justice in this way. And so they conclude by accusing not God, but Job. Job must have done something really, really bad for God to punish him like this. They even start making up possible sins that Job must have committed. Job protests to all of this. In fact, he gets so fed up with the friends that he eventually just gives up on them. He takes up his case directly with God. 
Now, something to be aware of is that Job, he's on an emotional roller coaster in these poems. He used to think that God is just, but now he can't reconcile that with his suffering. And so in some outbursts, Job, he'll accuse God of being a bully. Once he even declares that God has orchestrated all the injustice in the world. But the moment he utters that thought, he's terrified of it because he wants to hope and believe that God is truly just. Job is all over the place in this section. And so he makes one last statement of his innocence, and then he demands that God show up personally to explain himself. Now, it's at this point that a surprise friend shows up, Elihu the Buzite. Now, he's not an Israelite, but he does have a Hebrew name. And Elihu, he has the same assumption as Job and the friends. He argues that God is just and that that implies that God always operates the universe according to justice. But then Elihu draws a more sophisticated conclusion about why good people suffer. It may not be punishment for sin in the past. God might inflict suffering as a warning to help people avoid sin in the future. Or God might use pain and suffering to build character or to teach people valuable lessons. Elihu doesn't claim to know why Job is suffering, but one thing he is certain of, Job is wrong to accuse God of being unjust. Job doesn't even respond to Elihu and the dialogues come to a close. It's like the wisdom of the ancients has been spent and the mystery remains. And then, all of a sudden, God shows up in a whirlwind, and he responds to Job personally. He first responds to Job's accusation that he's unjust and incompetent at running the universe. So God takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe, and he starts asking him all these questions about the order and origins of the cosmos. Was Job ever around when God architected the earth or organized the constellations? Has Job ever commanded the sunrise or controlled the weather? God has his eyes on all of these cosmic details that Job has never even conceived of. Then God starts going into detail, describing the grazing habits of mountain goats and how deer give birth or the feeding pattern of lions and wild donkeys. What's the point of all this? Remember the assumption of Job and his friends about what it looks like for God to run the world according to justice. Underneath that assumption is a deeper one, that Job and his friends have a wide enough perspective on life to make such a claim about how God ought to run the world. And God's response with this virtual tour, it deconstructs all of these assumptions. It first of all shows that the universe is a vast, complex place and that God has his eyes on all of it, every detail. Job, on the other hand, has only the small horizon of his life experience to draw from. His view of the world is very limited. And so what looks like divine injustice, from Job's point of view, needs to be seen in an infinitely larger context. Job is simply not in a position to make such a huge accusation about God. After the virtual tour, God asks Job if he would like to micromanage the world for a day according to the strict principle of justice that Job and his friends assume, punishing every evil deed of every person at every moment with precise retribution. The fact is that carrying out justice in a world like ours, it's extremely complex. It's never black and white like Job and the friends seem to think. Which leads to God's last point. He starts describing these two fantastic creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan, which some people think are poetic depictions of a hippo and a crocodile. But more likely, they refer to well-known creatures from ancient Near Eastern mythology that are used elsewhere in the Bible as symbols of the disorder and danger that exist in God's good world. These creatures, they're not evil. God's actually quite proud of them, but they're not safe either. The point is that God's world is amazing and very good, but it's not perfect or always safe. God's world has order and beauty, but it's also wild and sometimes dangerous, just like these two fantastic creatures. And so we come back to the big question of Job's suffering. Why is there suffering in God's world? Whether it's from earthquakes or wild animals or from other humans, God doesn't explain why. What he says is that we live in an extremely complex, amazing world that at this stage, at least, is not designed to prevent suffering. And that's God's response. Job challenged God's justice. God responds that Job doesn't have sufficient knowledge about our universe to make such a claim. Job demanded a full explanation from God. And what God asked Job for is trust in his wisdom and character. And so Job responds with humility and repentance. He apologizes for accusing God and he acknowledges that he's overstepped his bounds. 
Then all of a sudden, the book concludes with a short epilogue. First, God says that the friends were wrong, that their ideas about God's justice were just too simple, not true to the complexity of the world or God's wisdom. And then God says that Job has spoken rightly about him. Now, this is surprising because it can't apply to everything Job said. I mean, we know Job drew hasty and wrong conclusions, but God still approves of Job's wrestling, how Job came honestly before God with all of his emotion and pain and simply wanted to talk to God himself. And God says that's the right way to process through all of this, through the struggle of prayer. The book concludes with Job having his health, his family, his wealth all restored, not as a reward for good behavior, but simply as a generous gift from God. And that's the end of the book. So the book of Job, it doesn't unlock the puzzle of why bad things happen to good people. Rather, it does invite us to trust God's wisdom when we do encounter suffering rather than try and figure out the reasons for it. When we search for reasons, we tend to either simplify God like the friends or like Job, accuse God, but based on limited evidence. And so the book is inviting us to honestly bring our pain and our grief to God and to trust that God actually cares and that he knows what he's doing. And that's what the book of Job is all about. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, I'm John. I'm the executive and teaching pastor here at The Grove. And I want to talk to you today coming out of this video uh, about some things we've been doing during the quarantine that I think will make sense to some of the, the questions and things we're going to explore today in terms of God's Word and specifically the story of Job. Uh, we decided in our spare time uh, that we were going to sit down and play the game of Monopoly. And now when I was a kid, I loved Monopoly. I loved it. In fact, I remember above all else playing it with my family and then also playing the McDonald's version of Monopoly where you would buy uh, food and milkshakes and french fries and other things and try to get all the game pieces and win prizes. And, and so I understood Monopoly really, really well. And so my daughter, we never really played it before. So me and Laura and Sadie sat down to play Monopoly the other night. And when I began to read through the rules, they were not what I remembered as a child. And I've had a few people from my community group uh, correct me on this, but apparently my understanding of Monopoly was, was pretty low. Uh, I did not realize that you could mortgage properties if, if you, in order to get extra cash, in order to buy other things, or that if you didn't want to buy a property, that there was an auction that happened. Like for me, it was all about pass and go, getting $200, staying out of jail, buying up properties, and, and maybe getting some hotels and houses if you were lucky enough. But Laura and I began to realize this game could go on forever because it was m way more complex than I realized or that I knew when I was young. And so I want to tell you, in under 30 minutes today, I'm not going to be able to completely address the full questions and all of their uh, complexity about suffering and justice in the world. Like it's, it's not going to happen in under 30 minutes because uh, this game, if you will, this understanding of life, it goes on forever. And I'm still learning, maybe like you are, a lot about the rules. And I'm learning that God's ways, by the way, are a lot more complicated than the full adult version of Monopoly that I did not understand. And so I want to just kind of touch on a few things. The video's done a good job, again, of, of teaching us things. So I want to touch on just a couple points today and make some observations. One, I just want to point out that the video really did not tell us fully everything that Job had lost when God allowed him to suffer. So I want to read from Job chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. I want to show you all the things that Joseph, excuse me, that Job had to lose. Uh, it says, there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. So he had 10 children. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. And so there's all the stuff that he had. That, that, that's a lot of stuff. Uh, but I, I want to understand when the suffering came, here's what happened to Job. In one sitting, like in one moment, he gets news of all the things I'm about to tell you. He receives news that he has lost everything but his wife and maybe a few servants who came to tell him the bad news about all the other stuff he had lost. Uh, and it happened in like all these seemingly random ways and by various things. In, in one case, there were two different armies 
that were unrelated to each other that attacked different parts of his estate and family. There was fire that just fell from the sky. I don't know if that was lightning and I don't know how the ancients would have uh, described that. And then uh, there was a great wind, which again, in Mount Juliet, uh, we can certainly you know, empathize with that. A great wind like a tornado came and it took down a particular house where all 10 of his children, they would gather monthly for parties. They were having a party, all 10 of his kids and all 10 were crushed under the dwelling that came down in the wind. And so this guy gets a lot of bad news. And also we know that he develops boils all over his body so that he's suffering. And we find him sitting in a pile of ashes with broken pottery. And so ash was a way in the ancient world uh, to mourn. But he's taken the broken pottery and he's itching so bad that he's just scraping through his boils and his wounds. So this guy is, is in a pretty low state, probably as low as any of us in our life uh, would ever experience. And this book, which again is an ancient book of wisdom, uh, it's, in, it's in the poetry section. And so we know that this story is not happening in the chronological order. It probably happens somewhere between the Tower of Babel and before Abraham. So it's somewhere in there most likely. And this book begins to ponder poetically a lot of the questions. But I want to tell you that the book is not just about suffering. And I know that suffering is a topic that the whole world before coronavirus, before the tornado, before all the things that have happened, every time, man, there's a school shooting, every time uh, that there is a tsunami in Asia, every time that we see mass destruction and earthquakes and, and all kinds of horrible things, uh, when we see genocide, we, we begin to ponder these questions, especially when it kind of comes close to home. And so right now we're probably pondering this more than usual because the coronavirus situation affects everybody in the world in some way. It's something that we all have to think about. And so lots of us are pondering, just as they were in the ancient days, sort of the nature of suffering in the world and why. But this book really, as the video says, doesn't answer that question, though we're going to address it a little bit today. And again, we got 30 minutes and we're not going to get all of the things in. But what it does address is whether or not God is just. And then if he is just or not just, does he run the universe or the way things work in this life and, and in this world? Does he run it by uh, some system of justice? Or is it kind of like, you know, for, for me, when I was playing Monopoly, it was always just about whatever the roll of the dice was. I would roll the dice and it would get me to another square. And it, it, would, it would help me find my way through. It was kind of all based off of luck or whatever card that I would draw. So is God like moving things according to a plan of justice or are we just rolling the dice? So I'm going to kind of address two questions today in, in that respect. And the first one's going to be that one. Is God just? Is God just? Now, Every time we marvel at the fact that something bad has happened to someone we love or sometimes we marvel that something good has happened to somebody that we don't particularly love, then we're asking this question about God's justice. It may not be this explicit question that we say, oh, is God just or not just? That may not be the way that you say it may not be the way that you're hearing it or reading it on social media or on the news, but almost every drama that you watch on television, every movie, they're, they're all kind of asking this question. Man, if you're watching Tiger King right now, uh, some of you guys, maybe I'm not endorsing it, but we sit there when we watch it uh, and, and we ask the question, how could all of these things happen? Are these people deserving or not deserving of what's happening and all the crazy things? And so it kind of all comes back to that central question. We may not be saying, is God just? But we're asking is, is there some order to the way that things happen based upon someone being deserving or not deserving of the good or the bad that happens to them? The world of social media certainly debates it all the time. Uh, who is good and then gets something bad that they don't deserve? That's something that we post about a lot, like a, a child becoming sick becoming deathly ill, or a generous actor or a generous athlete uh, who gets injured, or a likable person even, someone that everyone likes online, uh, suffering some great loss. And so we, we ponder and we feel that, oh man, there's, there's empathy for that situation, and sometimes even anger against, wow, how could that bad thing happen to that person that we all consider good? And then there's also on social media and in life, and it goes again all the way back to the ancient books. So what we're posting right now are the same questions that have been being posted throughout all of history. 
is there's someone who's seemingly not good uh, who gets something good that they don't deserve. And that kind of inflames us the same way, like a, a rich man who cheats the system and finds a way to just get richer and, and never has to pay the price for it. Or a crooked politician who keeps getting reelected, uh, who may be even rigging the election or, or speaking in ways that he or she should not, yet they continue to, to prosper. Or a murderer who gets set free from prison off of some legal technicality. And so what I'm saying is, is we're always pondering how the relationship between good and bad things and circumstances is connected to someone's character that we perceive to be good or bad. And we have this sort of base assumption that if this person over here is a deserving person is good, then the bad things should not happen to them. And we consider there to be like this logical cognitive dissonance between those two things so that every time something seemingly bad happens to someone seemingly good or something seemingly good happens to someone seemingly bad, that we are in tension over that. It doesn't seem fair to us. And fairness is just an expression of justice, of what we consider to be right and wrong or what we think justice really was. I can imagine if Job was on Twitter <laughs> during this time, I can just imagine all of his hashtags, hashtag suffering, hashtag really, hashtag why. Like he is asking that question, his friends are asking that question, why? And that's the same question that we're asking. So when we say, is God just, it really means this. Do God's actions align with our definition of justice? Do God's actions allow, or align with our definition of justice. And what we generally define justice as, whether we know it or not, and I, I'm kind of like challenging my own assumptions today. And so I'm inviting you to open up your mind because you may think, well, I don't think that way. But if you begin to look at the way you respond, perhaps you do in ways you don't know. I think that most of us evaluate justice and fairness and good and bad based upon uh, this idea that we think things should have an equal and an opposite reaction to them. And it sort of comes out of the scientific method even, but that we believe that everything is based off of cause and effect. Uh, we see this in the Gospels. Whenever there was an accident and someone asked Jesus, hey, this accident that happened, uh, or they would even come to him and say, hey, this sickness or, or this kid who's, who's possessed by this evil spirit, like, was this a cause or was this caused by the sin of his parents or by his own sin? And Jesus would be like, look, you guys evaluate. The world seems to evaluate everything off of cause and effect, off of some opposite and equal uh, reaction to whatever action was taken. And I'm telling you that it's just not that simple. And so when we begin to ask, is God just what we're asking is, is he just according to that assumption? that there's going to be this equal and opposite reaction? The answer is, according to that definition of our justice, no. And Job answers that question for us. Doesn't answer all the questions about suffering, but this question is certainly answered. And I think when we begin to realize that we're only defining justice by our own ability to see it, that we put God, certainly, or our questions that torture us about God, are all based on something that may not be related to the way that God sees the universe and versus the way that we see the universe. Let me give you an example that might help. So if you think God is, is only rewarding for good and bad, even though if you believe in grace and you may listen to our messages, but you still kind of, if you're like me, you, you live your life expecting blessing for where you've done good and expecting uh, punishment for where you've done bad, that kind of seems like the right way. It, it's sort of the way we raise our children. It's the, it's the way that our, our, certainly our court systems are based upon that. And I'm not saying there are not reactions that come, but we want an equal and opposite. Like, I want this in proportion to what is deserved, either good or bad. If, if that's how we look at it, ask yourself this question in your own life. Have you received every bad thing that you really deserve? I don't mean the things that everyone knows about. If truly the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his, which is what the Bible says in Chronicles. If he's going to strongly support those whose heart is completely his, 
Do you make that cut? You see, I know my heart. Well, I don't really know my heart, but the parts that I discover, I discover things in there that, man, I'm, I'm probably way further away in myself apart from the grace of Jesus than I ever thought I was. And, and that's not just some dismissive statement to sound religious. It's true. In my region, small group, I tell the guys all the time, man, until I started writing about that, I didn't realize how dark I really was there. And then I find myself when we, we get to share and decide what we want to share, I really want to share the parts that don't make me look as bad as I really am. And so it, it takes discipline to say, guys, I'm going to share something with you because here's how I know it's what I should share. It's the thing I want to share the least. Why? Because I'm discovering that actually oh, there's parts of me that are way less deserving than I ever knew. Have you received every bad thing that you really deserve in life? And the answer is no. Let me ask you another question. Has every good thing that you've experienced in your life been a direct result of your good actions? Meaning all the good things that have happened to you, can you truly trace back and find a place where it was all in reaction to the good that you did, to a good seed you planted, a good deed that you did, a discipline that you followed through? Like, was it all truly caused by you, every good thing? And the answer is also no. And so we see it in our own lives, but we still judge God, the world, suffering, the questions. We seem to judge it by a different standard than what reality even is in our own universe. Because in our own universe, we know, if we're really honest with ourselves, that every bad thing that happened to us in our life has not happened if it was related to what we deserve. And every good thing that's happened to us is not in direct proportion to the good that we deserve. Matthew 5, 44 through 45, Jesus said it like this. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. And this is the one here. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And, you know, sometimes people quote that all the time like, well, Bad things happen to everybody because the Bible says he's, you know, it rains on the just and the unjust. This is an agrarian farming society. Both of these things, the sun and the rain, are good. These would be good things for the ancients. And they're good things for us. We just don't often realize it because of our indoor type <laughs> existence that many of us have. But what he's saying is, is that God gives more good to everybody than we understand. That the sun and the rain, that these global type things that are blessings upon people, that God is not dispensing to humanity or to us individually all the things that we deserve. And so the real question isn't, is God just? The real question is this. Do I or what do I think qualifies me to truly define and interpret justice. This is going to take humility, by the way, to ask that question. And if it feels dismissive or like, oh man, you, just don't, you don't want to answer the question. The Bible doesn't answer the question. There may be a reason that the Bible doesn't answer the question as directly as you want it, because this is the real question you probably should be asking. And we'll get to the reason why here in a moment. But ask yourself, what do I think qualifies me to truly define and interpret justice. I was, uh, this is funny, this topic came up, someone was asking one of my favorite authors, Tim Keller, this week on social media about, hey, did God send the coronavirus? And he's very uh, delicately and sensitively answering the question about people suffering. His church is in New York City, right there at the epicenter. And so uh, he, he's, on, he, he's at the ground zero of a lot of the suffering in our country right now. And here's something he said philosophically, and this was his philosophical answer. He said, look, it's not the personal one because that, this might not make you feel better, but it is something I think that fits for where we are here. He said, and I paraphrase a little bit, but he said, if you have a God who is big and powerful enough to be mad at for not stopping suffering, then you also have a God who is big and powerful enough to have good reasons for having not stopped it that you haven't thought of. Man, that just kind of blew my mind. If, if God is big enough for me to expect him to stop suffering, if he has that kind of power and he's that good, then he may be bigger than all the things that I have thought of to explain his action or what I perceive to be his inaction. That 
the very nature of what I expect for him proves that perhaps he's greater than I am. And so because of that, and it's not just like some false um, sense of blind faith or some false humility where we say, don't ask questions because Job proves to us it's okay to ask questions. Or you should just believe because and you shouldn't worry about suffering. Guys, that's just not reality. And I don't think it's the life of faith that God really invites his people to. I think what it brings to me, though, in my life is as I'm asking these questions of God, and guys, I have a lot. Even before all of these things, I find myself uh, being kind of brutally honest with God in the last year or so about things that I never really allowed to come to the surface in my conversations with him and with other believers. Uh, things I don't understand about this. And they're good and they're painful and they're uncomfortable, but they also have caused me to learn more about God as he reveals to me more about myself. And so maybe God has reasons that I am not capable of understanding that he couldn't even explain to me because I'm not capable of, ex of really taking them in. And man, that's the one that hurts our pride in the modern society because we believe if we have enough time with enough uh, social media and enough articles and enough books and we have enough experts and enough professors and enough scientists and enough doctors and enough philosophers, enough historians. If we have all those things that we truly can, it's our assumption, we truly can solve any problem, that we can take it into our mind and understand it. And the real question is this, if God is big enough to change things that we already can't change, then perhaps he's so big that there are some things we can't understand about what he's doing. And that's not blind faith. And that is not forced humility. That may be the nature of the universe that we already actually experience, but we're blocking our minds from truly trying to understand. The part we can understand may be <laughs> that there are things we can't understand. Now, that's not saying there are not things that we can observe, and I'm going to get to those. But it may mean to say, hey, perhaps we're asking the wrong question about the justice of God. Maybe we should be asking what qualifies me to define justice. I want you to note, by the way, that all of Job's friends in this story, they all felt qualified to evaluate the causes of suffering in the world. I mean, they're not just evaluating it for Job. They're evaluating it for you and for me. And in the end, when God speaks at the end, God makes it very clear that all of them were wrong. It was not as simple as they had made it out to be. And certainly it wasn't as punitive. That is, it wasn't based upon some equal and opposite cause and effect reaction related purely to their behavior. So that's that question of, is God just? And that's where I believe Job helps us see how to handle a question like that. And that final question today is this, why is there suffering in the world? Now, that's the one that we don't get an answer to in this book, but we do see a lot of hints and things we can look at. And so I want to answer the question of why there's suffering in the world. Are you ready? I'm going to give it to you because I think it's the right answer. We don't fully know. We don't know. It's okay to be a Christian. In fact, it's what a Christian should say sometimes, that we are not fully aware of all of these things. Like I just said, God has not chosen, or maybe most likely I'm not capable of understanding all those things. And that doesn't mean I don't learn and grow. It shouldn't hurt my pride. It, it should help me to have a more realistic viewpoint of who I am so that I learn and grow in the right things. And maybe I'll get more. Maybe I'll get incremental uh, revelation or understanding about things related to suffering in the world. But man, the right answer right now for believers as people are asking this question should not be some certainty of theological or political viewpoint. It shouldn't be some certainty about what God is doing right now because this is suddenly the end times. You really don't know that. I really don't know that. Furthermore, if this question becomes the linchpin, I have in my own life over the years, for myself and for friends and for family, people who this question of suffering in the world is the linchpin of whether they're going to believe or whether they're going to doubt. I want to tell you something from a guy who's doubted a lot. You will never be free in either of those places if this is your linchpin. Because ultimate doubt, if you just live in ultimate doubt, that is a belief that there's meaninglessness in the universe. It's not freedom. If you come to a place, well, there's just meaninglessness. There's nothing. There's no God. There's no way. There, and maybe God is unjust, but it'd be easy to believe that he's not there. That also, from what I've experienced in my own life, meaninglessness does not lead to freedom either because it's not true is the main reason. And so mystery is not just something that God has created. We're like afraid of the answer mystery. 
But mystery is not just something God created to confuse us or to frustrate us. This is about our nature versus his nature. Our small viewpoint of God and our large viewpoint of ourselves. That's really the issue. And we may be the most amazing things in creation, yet by comparison with something that is infinitely higher than us, we're still pretty low. It doesn't mean we're low in value to God. It just means that God has no ceiling. And so it's not like he topped out and we're coming up to him. God has no top. God has no ceiling to his understanding, his ways, his power, his goodness. And so we do have a ceiling. Because of that, no matter how you measure it, it's, a, it's an infinite distance between the eternal and between who we are in terms of ability and understanding. And so I've been thinking about this a lot lately. That, that puts me in doubt about a lot of things. And you know, we had that phrase, when in doubt, do this or do that. Right now, there's a lot of us, we're in doubt. It doesn't mean we don't have answers for some things. It just means we don't have the full picture. And it's okay to say we're in mystery. But when in doubt, some of us, myself included, I tend to speak more. Like when I'm in doubt, I want to work it out. And sometimes if I work that out publicly, it can do damage. I, it's okay to speak more in doubt. I need to do so in safe places with community. Because I don't need to speak definitively with certainty like Job's friends did about things that I may not be able to fully see. When in doubt, we theorize more. When in doubt, we act more certain. It, it, it's sort of like a, a defense mechanism. I, I'm struggling here, so I'm going to come off very certain and strong about the way things really are. And in that state of being, there's very little realization about our true state of being. And that's this. We are created in God's image, but we are not God's. And this is also a feature of his grace because we could not handle it justly. And so when in doubt, maybe I should speak less. When in doubt, maybe I should trust more. When in doubt, maybe I shouldn't act more certain, but I should be seeking after expressing the things that we are certain about, about the nature of God. You see, the friends may have been trying to help Job, but they didn't. And they were wrong about their certainties about God. So we shouldn't be so certain in the way that we treat the suffering and the blessing of the people in the world and near us. We shouldn't be so certain about those things. We cannot be certain about all of God's reasons for allowing suffering, but listen, we're not left completely in the dark either. Mystery doesn't mean we don't have some glimpses into parts of God's nature and God's ways. There are clues left to us in Scripture, many of them, about God's ways, and there are certainties given to us about God's ultimate nature. So we don't have to be in, in mystery about his nature. And so I'm going to close with these few observations about God's ways and God's nature. One, God didn't send the suffering. The accuser did. God did allow it, but he was also right about Job's ultimate end being for his good. God planned good for Job. He may struggle with the fact that God allowed suffering. But again, we're not understanding all the parts of God's system of justice because we know that ours is flawed. He didn't send it, though. And that goes to number two. God did not give the accuser the ultimate right <clears throat> to inflict the suffering on man. Adam and Eve did. The possibility of suffering was allowed by us. Though again, God did give us the right to choose it. And so a state of suffering was not God's original and best intention for us. We have chosen it. A state of suffering is not the way God wanted it to be. He did grant us choice and, and we can be upset with God about that. But boy, that's getting into some deep mysteries of the universe because we might be just as upset with a God who does not give us that choice. But what we can know is before the choices that Adam and Eve made, God did not bring this kind of suffering into the world. Adam and Eve and the accuser did together and God told them not to do it and they did it anyway. Number three, God made it clear that Job's suffering was not divine punishment for wrongs committed. So if we define justice only by our own arbitrary rubric of cause and effect for good and bad committed, then we're not judging as God judges. Hey, man, we get the right to judge as we want to, but we're not judging the way that God does. I may not understand all the ways that he does, but I can know this. It's not a simple good for evil right for wrong, wrong for right. It's not arbitrary. And that's why God says, hey, you may not want to be the ones who are judging because you don't understand all the things that I understand that I can see. Number four, though he corrected him, God honored Job's struggle, 
honesty, and prayer. Man, if there's one big takeaway for you today, understand this. God does not want you to disengage your mind and stop approaching him, even in anger, even in frustration. Don't stop approaching him with your anxiety. Don't stop asking the questions. This book may lead us to ask better questions, but it does not tell us we shouldn't approach because all the friends came to Job, but Job went to God and God honored that. And God honors it in us today. We can be real with God. Pastor Andrew talks all the time about vulnerability with God, not just with others, but vulnerability with God. Hey, be yourself, bring those issues and questions. And as you learn more about God's nature, you'll learn to rest more in who God is. And finally, in the end, God not only restored, but also disproportionately blessed Job. And that is the whole theme throughout the common thread of Scripture is that there's suffering and there's mystery to it. And it's something that God allowed us the choice to bring into the world and that God is throughout history and eternity working towards to restore all things. And that's really the real question is, do we believe that, that God can be trusted there? So all the questions of justice, that's one thing. But notice in the end, God restored and disproportionately blessed Job because he loved him and he loves you, too. And so let me just pray over you today, wherever you are in your life and, and maybe in suffering, to, to come to a place where you don't stop asking the questions. It's okay to ask the questions, but maybe God leads us to the questions that reveal more about His nature and bring us that comfort so that we're not just lost and swirling about in, in meaninglessness, but that we find a place where uh, we're secure in the love, the sovereignty, and the mystery of God, not uh, disengaging intelligent questions, but directing them towards the things that we are capable of understanding. Lord, today, for my friends, for our families, God, for those who suffer and are sick, we pray you'd be our healer. We pray, Lord, uh, for all the questions that are being asked today, that, God, we would not be certain in our expression of faith about things that we shouldn't be certain about. But God, we would be certain about things that we should be certain about. And that is the love of God for people that we would listen and respond with empathy, humility and kindness, Lord, as we all bring our questions and our issues to you as your servant Job did. And as you restored all things to him, we know you'll restore all things to this world. So we trust in you and love you and commit our lives to you in good seasons and in bad, realizing that we are not getting all the things that we deserve, but you are infinitely merciful. And so we rest in that mercy over us today in Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, welcome to Grove Kids Children's Church. It's good to see you again. I'm Pastor Roy, and yep, we're still stuck at home. But you know what? That's okay. It's okay. We can still have a good time, and we can still spend some time 
learning about God. Hope you had a great week last week. Last week we learned all about the resurrection, how Jesus died on the cross, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave and became our Savior. And how that very day he brought us grace and mercy and gave us a way to have a relationship with God the Father. So I hope you had a great Easter. And today we're going we're gonna to continue talking about that big word we started at the very first of the month. How many of you remember what that word was? Word started with the letter P. It was perseverance. Perseverance, which means to go the long haul, to not give up, to stick to it. So today we're going to talk about that. I've got a uh, Bible uh, story that I want to read you or a something about one of our Bible characters. You know, last week we talked about Jesus and how Jesus endured the cross. Endured the cross meaning he persevered through it. He got through it knowing on the other side was great glory and forgiveness and mercy for you and me. So he persevered. He endured through the cross. And then the week before we talked about Noah and how Noah endured that whole trip on the ark. How many days? 40 days and 40 nights, and then even longer than that before he could come out because when it set on the mountain, all the water had to drain down, and it took it almost a year. So for a year, Noah persevered, endured, stuck through, did not give up, and, and trusted in God while he was in that ark. And then we talked about Abraham and Sarah and how Sarah laughed at God because she was given an impossible promise by God. But because she was faithful and Abraham was faithful and they trusted God and they didn't give up on God, God did what? He made them a great nation, gave them a son, Isaac, and God will do great things for you and me. He'll do the impossible if we trust him, we put our faith in him and we endure. We run the race and don't give up. You know, sometimes my life and your life Sometimes hard times come. Sometimes struggles come, right? Let's say this, this rope here. This is, this is just a long rope. It's like any other rope. It's got two ends, one there and one there. And both ends are equally distant from the middle. Now, Sometimes as we start off our life, as we grow, things are okay. Hey, we're born and we have a mom and dad to take care of us or, or grandma and grandpa take care of us. There's somebody there for us. And then maybe things might get rough. Maybe some problems might come along. And the longer life gets, the more times struggles seem to come along. And sometimes we see struggles in our life and we say, there's no way I can face those problems in life. I'm in, I'm in the middle, there's the middle of our rope, I'm in the middle of one of the biggest struggles I've ever faced. And if I'm facing this problem, how can I face it alone? There's no way that while I'm in the middle of this struggle that I can make it through. But God says, I, you can make it through. You can make it through because I'm here for you. When you're in the middle of the problems that you face in life, no matter how big they are, when we're in the middle, middle of the problems, you know who's there with us? God's there with us. Jesus is always there with us, right in the middle of our problems. No matter how big or small they are, Jesus is there. He's right there in the middle with you and me, giving us strength to see it through. How many of you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Remember those three guys and how God saw them through? They had a big problem, didn't they? What was their problem? That great big giant statue, right? And a king that told them if they didn't bow down to that statue and worship that statue, he would throw them in a fiery furnace. Well, they trusted God. They believed in the one true God, didn't they? They believed in him. And when the music played and everybody bowed, they stood up. They stood up to the king. They stood up to the one that could throw them in the fire. They stood up to their problem. You see, when you and I see problems in life and we're in the middle of those problems and we're going through it, sometimes we say, that's it. I can't do it. I give up. And we say, there's no way I can make it through that problem. We just, I've reached the end of my rope, we'll say. I cannot make it through it. And we want to give up. But there's an old saying that says, 
no matter what happens, if you reach the end of your rope, you're to tie a knot and hang on. So we, we've, we've of course cut our rope in half here, so we're gonna see if we can't fix our rope. Let's tie a knot in it. Tie a knot and hang on. Don't give up, don't let go. Trust God no matter what. And when we trust God, He sees us through. And no matter how rough life gets, no matter how many times or how many knots we have to tie in that rope and hang on, we can hang on. Because who's in the middle of those problems with us? That's right. Jesus is there with us. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God was there with them. He was with them through the fire. And it says that when they came out of the fire, you know what? There wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. Their robes were totally gone and they weren't in the fire anymore. They came out and no problems. No problems because they trusted in God. Matter of fact, because they trusted in God and God put or was with them as they got put into the fire. He said, I will see you through the end. And the king then in turn saw how great God was. And then he told everybody else in the whole kingdom that they were to worship God because God's the one that sees everything, knows everything and knows what it is to go through the problems we went through. You see, that's why he sent Jesus. Jesus came to earth to be a person just like you and me, to be a kid just like you, and to go through the, some of the same problems you and I have gone through. All the problems we face in life, we can face them knowing that God's there with us, and he gives us the strength to persevere, the strength to endure, the strength to stick to it, no matter what, knowing that God is where our faith is placed and when we face our, our faith in God, we can do all things. We can endure all things. We can persevere through all things because God is there with us. Now I want to talk to you about one more fella. We've talked about Noah. We've talked about Abraham and Sarah. We've talked about Jesus. How many of you remember Paul? Remember Paul? You know, Paul did some great things. He went on some missionary journeys and shared Jesus with everybody. He's one of the reasons that we have the Bible as it is today. He wrote over half of the Bible, or half of the New Testament, that is. And I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians. This is the second time he wrote two letters to the people in Corinth. And this is the second letter. And he's telling them what it is to trust in God, even though we have problems. I'm reading in chapter uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, starting in verse 23. We're going to start about halfway through that verse. It says, I have worked harder. I have been put in jail more times. I have been beaten with whips more and have been in danger of death more often. Five times my own people gave me 39 lashes with a whip. Three times the Romans beat me with a stick. And once my enemies even stoned me. Can't you imagine that? They threw rocks at him, stoned him. Uh, let's see. I have been shipwrecked three times. I even had to spend the night and a day in the sea. During my many travels, I have been in danger from rivers, robbers, my own people, foreigners. My life has been in danger in the cities, in the deserts, at sea, with people who only pretended to be the Lord's followers. I have worked and struggled and spent many sleepless nights. I've gone hungry and thirsty and often had nothing to eat. I've been cold from not having enough clothes to be warm. Besides everything else, each day I am burdened down worrying about all the churches. When others are weak, I am weak too. When others are tricked into sin, I get angry. If I have to brag, I'll brag about how weak I am. God the Father of our Lord Jesus knows I'm not lying. And God is to be praised forever. You see, there's some big things that happened in Paul's life. Man, he faced shipwrecks. He faced being beaten. He faced being hungry. He faced being in prison. 
all these things, even being whipped and beaten, he was able to go through all those things. Why? Because he was some amazing apostle and he's this guy in the Bible we all look up to and he, he wrote the New Testament. No, no. He says, I brag about the fact that I'm weak. I don't have the strength in myself to go through those things that I had to go through. God gave me those strength. Praise be God the Father, he said. He gave me Jesus and with Jesus, I can endure all things. I can go through all things. I can persevere. You see, he saw his problems as not great big things. He saw his God as a great big thing. He saw his God bigger than any issue he would have to face. You know what? You and me, lots of times we see our issues as something too big to face. It's kind of how you look at things. You see, our problems, sometimes we think about our problems like this. I have this glass here and we're going to fill it up with milk. We see our problem as something big. We have the biggest glass over here. We're going to let it be our problems for just now. We've got a smallest glass over here, the smallest glass. It kind of reminds me of the David and Goliath story, how little Goliath had to face the great big giant, how that problem seemed so big, but he was so small. The problem was that giant. And that giant looked down at David and said, look, you are so small. What am I, a dog you bring? You bring a kid after me? Uh, what am I? You're going to chase me with sticks? That's how our problems are to us. They taunt us and make us think how small we are. But David didn't see it that way. David said, you know what? Problem? You big giant, you big problem? You're not that big. Yeah, you may be bigger than me, but you know who's even bigger than me and bigger than any problem? That's right, God. God, David said, I come against you in the name of God. Problem, you come against me? You want to tear me down? It's all right, I got God on my side. But we don't see it that way, do we? We look at our problems, you and me, when we're in the middle of the problems, and we look at how small we are compared to how big the problem is. And we think, man, if I was just a little bit bigger, if I was a little bit stronger, if I was a little bit smarter, I'd be able to face that problem. But then we get a little bigger, we get a little older, and then we're, we're like, man, I, I'm still not big enough. I'm still not strong enough. If I was a grown-up, man, if I was a grown-up, I could face this problem. And we get as grown-ups, you know what us grown-ups do? We look at the problems the same way, and we realize how big they are and how weak we are. And the truth is, is all of us are too weak to face our problems. But we can't give up. We can't let that stop us because God says, I'm bigger than any problem. Now, how do you look at it? We were looking at our problem in us. Now, let's say this is God. Let's say this is God and he's so much bigger than our problems and he's so much bigger than us. And no matter how big our problem is, he says, I'm going to give you the strength to face that problem. I'm gonna give you the ability to stand strong and persevere all the way to the end. Whether you're big or small, God says, I give you the strength to face everything. He says, you can endure, you can do all things because Jesus gives you the strength I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Great big God, little bitty you. When we let God in, then we can face any problems. And God says, that's not the only tool I give you. I'm going to equip you. Equip you means give you tools. I'm going to equip you to face anything, to get through anything. Not only through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but also through our communities. The Bible tells us to pray for one another, to bear one another's burdens. That means to help each other through their problems. If I've got a friend who's struggling, I'll call that friend and say, hey, how's it going? Let me help you. What is there I can do to help? I'm part of that person's community and I'm there to help them. The Bible tells us that we're to bear each other's burdens and then when we pray one for another, then we strengthen one another. 
So no matter how big my problem is, as long as I have God in my life, I let His Spirit fill me and give me strength to face those issues. And I share those problems with mom and dad, my Sunday school teachers, other boys and girls that trust Jesus just like I do, then they're able to help me get through those problems. I don't have to face them alone. And when I don't have to face something alone, then I get, I get stronger and I can face the bully or any other problems that might come along. I can even face this being trapped and not going anywhere because God gives me the strength through friendships and through His Son, Jesus. That's what perseverance is. Thanks for being with us today. Check out the downloads. Got some really cool things for you there. And we'll see you next week right here at The Grove.